where two or more are gathered in your name, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We are way beyond that. And so, Father, we just ask for your blessing tonight as we just open your word, study it, glean from it, Lord God, as best we can. And then, Father, have some good old tacos together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys doing all right today? Man, I sound like I'm kind of super loud, but that's all right. We'll wake them up, Sister Lori. Let the glory of the Lord arise among us. Let the glory of the Lord arise among us. Let the praises of the King Rise among us to let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord just rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us to let it rise. We sing, oh. Singing, oh, let it rise, 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 let the glory, here we go. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs, here we go. Let the songs of the Lord, hey, come on. Rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord Rise among us and let the joy of a king rise among us. Just let it rise. Sing oh, sing it oh, let it rise. Sing it oh. Let it rise. Let the glory, let me hear you sing it. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise. Let the praises of the King rise. Sounding good. One more time. Here we go, church. Let the glory of the Lord rise. Let the glory rise. Let the praises of rise among us. Let it rise. Amen. Sing it. And we say, oh, let it rise. Sing it, oh, let it rise, 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 let it rise.
Oh 
So we are coming to the end of the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. We're coming to the end of the earthly kings. And um, last week we had the privilege of studying the life of Manasseh in uh, 2 Kings chapter 21. <clears throat> He's the most wicked king of all. He... Um, Desecrated all the t the temple. He desecrated the the any holy thing of the Lord's. He set up obscene idols in the temple. He allowed temple prostitutes to serve in the temple. Can you imagine? Even even this church turned into a brothel would make you feel kind of weird, right? Can you imagine in the Lord's temple? That's just insane to think about. But Manasseh did those things, and not only that, but he slew many of the prophets of God, many of the men of God that would come and tell him what the Lord said. He slew them. He killed them. And <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a direct attack on the Lord, to the Lord. And yet, the Lord saved him as we studied at the very end of his life. He took him captive by the Assyrians and uh, took, put the hook in his nose and took him captive and uh, in the dungeon, he cried out to the Lord his God in the most darkest place of his life. He cried out to the Lord his God and it said the Lord delivered him. That's incredible grace. That's incredible mercy. That's the God that we serve. I had a conversation the other day with the young man and we were talking about sins and, and, and how to handle sins in somebody's life and I go, listen, we have to leave room for the Holy Spirit sometimes to judge a person when they're in sin and they're doing things they shouldn't be doing or they know they shouldn't be doing. We have to leave Holy Spirit. Because sometimes when we get in the way of that, we're not sure where the Lord's going. I mean, the example of the man picking up sticks, being stoned to death, and then King David, a murderer and adulterer, not being stoned to death. So we have to be careful we have to be careful how we, how we judge somebody's sin because God judges people's sins different than us. Even though he tells us what sin is, he tells us, he tells us that sin deserves judgment. And, and we know that people that sin are going to come under judgment. We know that nothing ever works out doing it wrong. We know that. So we always know and can leave room for the Lord to, to break their bicycle to get their attention. I'm not going to be an Assyrian captive to do the Lord's will. I want to be the ones waiting for Manasseh to come home and saying, man, you can do this now. And so um, Manasseh didn't get what he deserved, but then all of a sudden we're going to come to a son now, this chapter, and he's only going to last two years. God didn't give him no time, it seemed like, before he took him out. Manasseh had 50 years plus to be corrupt and to be vile. 
50 years, his son's only going to get two before the Lord takes him out. So who, it's, we don't know. We don't know the Lord's judgment. We don't know the Lord. All we know is that we need to be in line, do our part, find our place, find our walk. Make sure, don't worry about their walk. Make sure this walk is fine because that's what I do. Because every night I go home and I go before the Lord and I say, Lord, you know my heart. You know I'm not like what they might be saying or thinking or feeling. Lord, I'm not like that. Lord, I'm, you know, Lord. And the Lord says, go to church and look around and see who I have with you. I go, I got good people here. I got people I know the Lord is using and walking in and working. How would the Lord, why would the Lord put, put me in the wrong place to guide you I don't think he would do that to any, either one of us. I don't think that. I think that we deserve each other. <laughs> we deserve each other. We're messy people. But, but, but we understand that that's not an excuse to be sloppy. We just know that God is not going to be finished with us when we make a mess. Because God is who he is, and he gives us great examples in his scriptures, in his word. And so we're going to look at, um, we're going to pick up in um, verse 19 after uh, Manasseh passed away. Chapter 21, verse 19. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was a mouthful. The daughter of Haruz and Jotba. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. Now notice, Manasseh didn't finish bad, but his whole career was a bad career. And so Manasseh is going to be blamed for a lot of things and for something very severe in, in, um, In 2 Kings chapter 24, as we get to the end of the reign of the kings, right, this is going to be said when the, right before Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes him captive, or as they're coming to take him captive, it says, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim, which was the, the last king, Jehoiakim became of his vassal, which means he was just an under-shepherd to whatever the king of Babylon wanted, this king was willing to just be his puppet and just do it. And even though it was against the Lord's will and whatever it was, he just did it. But notice, you can't just be the friend of the devil forever because it says for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Not Jehoiakim rebelled against Babylon. It's Babylon rebelled against Jehoiakim because he takes him captive. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, bands of, the, bands of the people of Ammon. These are the same people whose gods the Jewish people took for themselves. So Jewish people were making connections to all these people. Hey, we're brothers. We're brothers. We're brothers. We got the same tattoo. We're brothers. Mm -mm. You're circumcised. You're different. You're not my brother. And they came against them. And it said, he sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servant, the prophets. Surely the commandment of the Lord, this, come upon, this came upon Judah to remove from his sight, because, remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. Even though Manasseh repented, even though Manasseh, Manasseh got saved at the end of his life. Manasseh left a lot of mess. And not only did he leave a lot of mess, but he left it so deep that the people could not shake it off that they're going to be judged by the things that their king led them into. Their government told them it was okay to be that way. Their government said it was okay. Teachers told them it was okay. Important people with lots of money told them it was okay to be that way and to do those things. Do whatever you want to do. Live and be whatever you want to be. But then the day comes that the judgment's going to come on all that. Even the devil's going to laugh at people for buying into that, buying into those lies. The devil's going to mock those people. It says, remove from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. 
and according to all that he had done, and because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now, I will tell you this, the Lord will not pardon, but he will cover and do away with when the, that's what the blood does, right? To the individual, not to the society. So the Lord is telling him. I just think it's interesting that, that Manasseh, even though he finished well and he tried, he tried to get back to the in control and try to, he said he built the walls and he tried to rebuild things, but it was too late. It was too late. It says, um, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked. So it says he was 22 years old. So he saw his father start off bad and end up good. But what he clung to was the, the lust, the, 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 the sins like that. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked. And he served the idols that his father had served and worshiped them. For he he forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Then the servants of Ammon conspired against him and killed the king in his own house. His own servants came in and assassinated him. Now, I think it would be interesting to know what their motive was. But that would just be man's way of finding out why you know, something happened when it was really all the Lord's will in the in the end anyways. It is not any reason that our church is in the situation it's in. We're in the situation we're in because the Lord put us here. The Lord is teaching us some things here. The Lord is working some things. There are some things for us to learn through this, right, Joe? There are some things for us to learn through this and grow from, but we're not here because of any one reason or any one person. We're here because the Lord brought us here. It doesn't matter why you get there. They don't tell us why they plotted to kill him. It doesn't give us a backstory because the backstory doesn't matter. What matters is what the Lord did and what he's going to do through this. And it says, um, but the people of the land executed, because we know that it was the Lord's will to take him out because it says, it tells us that no king sits on the throne without his will and he's the one that removes them. So we know that whoever he used he used their evilness to do his bidding so that he could judge their evilness. But the people of the land ex executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. Interesting. Because Josiah is eight years old when his father's killed. And, and, and uh, legend says that he was right there and witnessed his father being killed right in front of him. But Josiah... Is, is an interesting king for us. Josiah is a king of hope. And um, it says, and his son Josiah made Josiah king in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon, which he did, are, not they, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? He was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah. The, then Josiah, the, his son, reigned in his place. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned 31 years. So how old was he when he died? Now, it's interesting that his grandfather, Hezekiah, was told when he was 39 he was going to die. And he prayed for more years and got 15 more years. And those years weren't his best years. But his sons were born during those years. Interesting that we don't see Josiah do that. We don't see Josiah asking for more life. But we see something different in Josiah that we haven't seen in a king before. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, an easier name to pronounce. The daughter, and I probably still didn't pronounce it right, the daughter of Adiah of Boscoff. And he did what was right. We don't see that very often. That's great to see. That. That's what we want the Lord to say about us. He's doing it right. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. That is great. That is a great testimony. We don't see that from a king, especially such a young one. 
It says, now it came to pass. Now, this, now he's going to give us his journey. Okay? It says, now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah. So he's 27 now, 26. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the, the king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulah, the house. Hold on. You know, let me just take a step back. Because in Chronicles, when you read the story, it adds that he started to seek the Lord at the age of 18. At 16, he began to seek the Lord. Somewhere in that age. And, I, and, I, and when I read that in Chronicles, because I go read, read the, the story to see if there's any extra, extra stuff over there. And one of the things that I realized that, that it said that when he was six, I think it was 16, when he started seeking the Lord. And uh, I remember when I was about that age, wanting to know if God was real. And I went to my mom one day, and I, go, I think I was around that age, and I go, Mom, what's the deal with God? And I didn't know a whole lot to say, but she bought me a Bible, which I didn't want. That's, I didn't want a Bible for my birthday. It's 16 years old, huh? And we visited the Catholic Church. <laughs> oh, that was the one I remember because that's the one I got confirmed. Uh, I got uh, First Communion in, right? First, I was 16 years old getting First Communion. Remember I tell you, I'm with all the little girls, and then the, I'm 16 years old, and there's me, me and my brother. But you know, it's funny that, my, that, that something came alive in me to want to know about God at that age. And here's this king whose father was the wicked guy. Something stirs up inside of him, and it said he started seeking the Lord. And then it said, then, and that's what it says in Chronicles, but in, in Kings, it goes on to say, then, his, then the 18th year of his kingship, and you add eight years to that, that would make him 26. So he's 26 years old, and he begins this different kind of journey to be the king over the nation that's God's people. And so his journey right now is to lead the people back to God. Because they've been led astray for years. And so his goal and his, his desire is to lead them to the Lord. And it says, So it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Zalia, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hil Hilkah, the high priest, that he may count the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers had gathered from the people. So he says, go to the priest, and let's find out, and let's start rebuilding the temple in its right place. Well, if you look on my graph right here that I have, this graph is the, is the, is, is the timeline of creation. And we're or the Old Testament. This is the timeline of the Old Testament. So we've gone through all this Old Testament. We are down here like in 586, fall of the southern kingdom. We're right before we get there. That's how far we are into the Old Testament timeline. We're almost at the end of the Old Testament. And so we're just a couple hundred years from there. And so you'll see, it says the period of the kings, it'll, it'll list... Um, the, the kings that we're talking about right now, where it says 1 Kings 12, 2 Kings chapter 25, and 1 and 2 Chronicles, you'll see all these prophets that are in the Old Testament. All these prophets, when you go back and you read these particular books, and you can, you can, you can ask me about this and I'll get it to you later. You go back and you read these prophets. Every one of their prophets are to these kings. Hosea has some interesting prophets to the king and to the times. I went and read his book today, and he's, he's the one that the Lord told him to go marry a prostitute. Marry a prostitute. And then have a son by her. And he had a son by her, and, and, uh, and his son's name was God's Will. And then uh, he has another son, and his, his, his name means, like, cast out. And the Lord is trying to tell his people that because of what you're doing... You're like a prostitute, and I'm trying to marry you. You're, you're worn out to other nations and giving yourself to these other religions and these other faith, these other ideas and these other ways of thinking. But yet I'm still trying to get you back. I'm still what you know. I'm married to you. I'm committed to you. That's how the Lord is. He looks at us as prostitutes sometimes, when we're, especially when we're going out and chasing the world. And they want to come home to him and say, I'm clean. So Jeremiah... And Ezekiel and Daniel are during the time from the 
when, when the kingdoms stop and their prophecies, Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's going to be the last prophet to kind of talk these, 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 these say it's coming. It's, it's coming. Your, your captivity's coming. But it's interesting that um, in 1 Kings chapter 13, 300 years before we get to Josiah, 300 years before we get to Josiah, he's prophesied about in 1 Kings 13. And behold, a man of God, this was when Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was going crazy. Remember, Rehoboam is the son, when he took over Solomon's kingdom, he went to the old men and said, hey, how should I govern the people? And they said, be cool with them, show them some grace, just show them some respect, and you'll get all the love back. But then he went to his young buddies that were raised with him, the spoiled ones, the rat pack, and said... How do you think I should do it? Man, treat them like scorpions. Sting them. If they, hit, if they rebel, hit them harder back. And just be hard, be hard, be hard. Well, as soon as he did that, the kingdom split. Well, one of the prophets went to him, Rehoboam, and this is what he said. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense because that was one of Jeroboam's sins. He wanted to be a priest and a king. Then he cried out against the altar, by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar. Now, this is the man of God saying this. O altar, altar. Thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high place who burn incense on you. And men's bones shall be burned upon you. Now, that's a crazy prophecy. In Deuteronomy, well, I'll come back to that one. Let's get to this one. All right, let's read. Because watch what Josiah does. It says, um, you know what? Hilkah, Hilkah, the high priest. Let me show you this real quick. Check this out in case you didn't know. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkah. So who's the priest? That Josiah goes to the father of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's alive right now. We don't know how old he is, but he's alive right now. He's a part of all this. He's witnessing, he's witnessing all this. It says, of the priests who were at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year, 13th year of his reign. It also came in the days of Jeho- Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So it tells us that Jeremiah is one of the priests that is consulting with Josiah on how to get back to the Lord. They're, they're far away from the Lord right now because of the false kings and because of the false idol worship and all the, 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 the going after the other nation's gods. And yet here is God planting Hilkah and Jeremiah right in the hands of Josiah because Josiah is on a journey and God brought the right person into his life to help him with that journey. Look, that's how I want to be in your life. That's how you should want to be in other people's lives. We want to be part of the way that people discover, lead people to the Lord. Did you know that that, that part of my testimony is I had a direct word from the Lord that told me that he was going to use me to give men direction on how to find him. I was, I was early in my walk. My wife that I was married to back then was jacking with my head, and, 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 and she messed with my head. And I, and I went out one night, and I messed up. And I remember waking up the next day crying, just, just, just crying to the Lord, saying, Lord, that's not me. I don't know why I let myself just go like that, Lord. And I just remember weeping, and then the guy walks up to me. As I was crying, doing a tile job, I went to go work at my dad's place, and, 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 and I saw him coming. I got up, and I said, can I help you? He goes, I'm looking for a, the, the convention center, Heart of Texas Convention. Heart of Texas, yeah. And I said, uh, go this way, make a right, go this way, go this way, go this way. And he goes, I hey, appreciate it. And then he, he handed me a business card. And when he handed me that business card, I looked at it, and it said, it said line of the tribe of Judah motorcycle ministries. And I thought, man, that guy's a Christian. And I'm early in my Christian walk. I didn't know there was motorcycle Christian clubs. And then I flipped the card over, and it says, if we meet and you forget me, you've lost everything. But if you meet Jesus Christ and forget him, 
I mean, if you, if you forget me, you've lost nothing. And I went, Lord, thank you for loving me and sending that man. And he said, then the Lord spoke to me audibly. He said, the same way that you gave that man direction, I'm going to use you to give other men direction on how to find me. And I wasn't preaching back then. I was only saved my second year. But look at where the God's put me. And I, I just know that's him in my life. He, I'm not any more special than any one of you. I'm just allowing him to use me to the extent that I allow him to use me. And that's, that's where you're at. You're, you, you're only limited by you. <laughs> Your only limitation is you, not him. He has so much for us. He wants us to know more about him. He wants us to know so much that we can't even stand up and is thinking about him. That's how much he wants us to know him. That just the thought of his presence would just drop you to your knees because you just know, you just know. And there are times that that happens to us, right? There are times when he's just overwhelming. We just know he's there. We know he exists and we know he's present with us right then and there. You can know that. And it's not, you, you don't trance yourself up to that. You don't work yourself up to some kind of trance to get there. You just desire it. You just want it and hunger for it and cry out for it. And it will come. He, his word will come alive and he will speak to you from his word. And it won't just be a Bible study word. It'll be a living word. Well, you know that's his voice speaking that word. Interesting. Right? Interesting. So we know Jeremiah is going to be in this behind the scenes. And it says, um, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money which, he had been, which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house. To carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. We're not going to keep up with the money. We trust you with it. That was awesome to, to hear, to think, you know what? That's the way it should be. You should just give it and trust. Leave, leave, let the Lord put lightning on us. Let the Lord curse us. Let the Lord take us out. Let the Lord expose us. Trust the Lord with your giving. Trust the Lord as you hand it to him. Don't trust us. Trust the Lord. And then, then just, let the, just trust the Lord will deal with us. I promise you, he will. We, we, we truly know the responsibility we have with what's been given to us. I assure you. But I appreciate the fact that the people just, even the king says, there'll be no accounting. Just, I trust you. You're faithful men. Then Hilkah, the high priest, said to Stephen, Shapen, I mean the, the scribe, listen to this. I have found the book of the law. It was lost. How's the Bible lost to the people it was written to? It was lost. None of the kings wanted anything to do with it. You can imagine Manasseh would say, and a, a priest probably hid it, knowing that Manasseh would have burnt it if he'd have found it or one of those other ungodly kings. So he probably hid it. And preserved it, just like the ark is today, hidden and preserved somewhere, tucked away. <laughs> I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Notice, he doesn't even have the law in his hands to know exactly what to do. He's just doing what's coming natural because he's seeking the Lord and the Lord is leading him. The Lord is guiding him and, and, and moving his mind and his hands and his feet and his thoughts in a direction that's in the right direction. Because now he's going to get the law of the Lord in his hands and he's going to go, I'm going in the right direction, but we are so far away from where we need to be. And this man is going to do everything he can to bring them back to revival. And remember, if you were here last week, that when he does bring them back to revival, he throws the biggest Passover party Israel has ever seen since the first one. That's how excited he is to get back to worshiping the Lord in a good, pure, righteous way. 
That's just the best way. It says, um, your servants have gathered, gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilka, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Listen to this. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law, they tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilka the priest, Achan, Achim, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asiah's servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all of Judah, concerning the words of this book that, he has, that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written. Listen, concerning us, he knew it was about them. This is the last one I'm going to show you, and then we're going to eat some tacos. I was, I, I, listen, it says he read, I don't think he read the whole book to him. I think he picked a passage, and he read a passage to him. The way he tore his clothes when he heard the passage, and then what he said about what he read about He said, uh, um, the wrath, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, that's on us at this moment, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. So I'm thinking he read a passage like this. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 58, it says, if you do not carefully, that's a powerful word too, that means, hey, you can't just do it nonchalantly. You must do it with a focused mind. If you you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name. As I said earlier, when you hear his name and you think about him, we should collapse, right? The Lord your God. Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sickness. Moreover, he will bring, you, bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, the ten plagues, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. I'll make up plagues. I'll make up new plagues. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars, of heaven and multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. It shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the people. See, he just seen that the Israelites, the the southern king, no, oh, Judah's the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, my bad. The northern kingdom is gone and displaced. He sees that just like this. From one end of the earth until the other, and there you shall serve other gods which, you, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have any resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at the evening you shall say, oh, that it were morning because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. You know, it's interesting that when COVID hit, how many people feared in a way that I've never seen people fear before. Fear life, fear death, fear it, it troubled them. It, so much fear that it made them angry at their loved ones. Fear that it brought dissension between loved ones because of the fear of it. And, you know, some of us feel captive to that fear, but no more. We have a good God. We have a faithful God, right? Amen. Let's pray and have some tacos. Lord, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you allow us to grow. You allow us to mature, and you allow us to 
be pruned at the same time. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in Calvary Chapel, but especially what you're doing in the hearts of the people in Calvary Chapel. Lord, I thank you for the hearts of those that serve here on staff and volunteers, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for the commitments for the, from the volunteers and the staff, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for the years of taking care of us and the commitment you gave me, Lord God, that you would finish what you started. And so, Father, we just ask you to bless this food tonight and that there's plenty of it, Lord, in Jesus' name. When you go through the line, if you'll just get to one taco until everybody else has a taco, and then you can go back and get a second taco. They should be, you know, the, you know what, why these are the best tacos in the world right now? Because they're free, and they turn into nachos by the end of the time.